once, probably twice. Presbyterian Church. It is a great delight to be able to have uh, the right Reverend Dr. Cameron Clousing uh, to grace the pulpit this morning to open the <coughs> Word of God. Uh, he comes to us all the way from Sydney, Australia, which is where I celebrated the new year. I stayed up right up until Sydney was having their new year. Just about lunchtime here. <laughs> we, are, uh, we are a blessed people. And uh, as we come this morning, we celebrate the good news in this new year of God's grace abounding to us. It's Paul's subject in 1 Corinthians uh, or as uh, Cam instructed us this morning, 1 Corinthians, uh, it, is, uh, it is the subject that Paul takes up, the great and glorious good news of the gospel, sealed by the resurrection. And in chapter 15, uh, following his uh, beautiful discourse, he simply declares, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Your God is in the midst, a mighty one who will save. 
He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. scripture reading from 1 Peter chapter 1. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. 
Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. to us from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 9. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, now you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I begin, I said in first service that I have found it necessary for those that don't know me to begin with an apology. Uh, the apology is that when you read my bio and you hear George say that I, I am from Sydney, Australia, you expect a cool accent. Uh, unfortunately, my wife got the cool accent and my children are getting the cool accent and I am stuck with this accent. though. In Australia, I have the cool accent, so <laughs> the majority of my life I win. It, it, is a, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you today and to stand behind the sacred desk, and particularly to stand behind this pulpit, uh, is especially humbling for me because it was uh, 10 years ago this year that uh, I was behind this pulpit after having been ordained and pronouncing the benediction at my ordination service as an assistant pastor here at Parish Presbyterian Church. Um, it was, uh, it, it was a, a lot has changed in those 10 years. Um, but the thing that hasn't changed is that standing behind this pulpit is particularly humbling for me. Um, as I contemplated the opportunity to preach this week, I, I was brought to uh, one Peter, uh, first Peter for those of you that speak normal English, um, and, uh, and as, I, as, I, as I sat down with this passage, I was reminded that the first sermon I ever preached here at Parish, which for those of you that heard it, I'm sorry, um, the first sermon that I ever preached here at Parish was from 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. If I come back in a few more years, maybe I'll preach 1 Peter chapter 3. And we can, get, we can just kind of every five years get, a, uh, get the whole sermon series out of the way. <laughs> so um, before we look at this passage, let's go before the Lord one more time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day and we thank you. We thank you that even while we sojourn in this land, you are with us, setting before us the hope of an inheritance awaiting us. We thank you that even while we were born into another family, you have caused us to be born again by your love into your family. So now we ask you, Lord, to work through your spirit, to open our 
ears to hear your word, open our hearts to receive it, open our hands to respond to it. For we pray all of this in the name of your Son, our elder brother, the risen Lord Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, the seed that crushed the serpent's head. We pray it by the power of his Spirit who live and reign with you, one God, always and forever. Amen and amen. I, uh, I came to the U.S. Uh, a month before my family actually joined me. My, my children were finishing school in Australia, uh, and I had some academic conferences that I had to go to. Uh, if you've never gone to an academic conference, I don't recommend it. It's uh, not the most exciting thing in the entire world, but it's my job, so I have to do it. It's a weird experience, actually, going to these types of conferences. It's a weird experience because most of the people there are incredibly accomplished in their careers. I mean, these are people that have written books. They're people that are writing books. They're, there are tenured professors there. And, and, and yet, as you walk around this group of brilliant people, what you realize is that each and every one of them is incredibly insecure. <laughs> it, it's a bit like going into a middle school lunchroom and wondering, do I get to sit with the cool kids? So you kind of like walk up and you're like, you see Scott Swain and, and Michael Allen and Fred Sanders having a conversation. None of you guys know who, this, who these people are. So like you see how dorky this, this world is. And you're kind of like, hey, maybe, maybe they'll talk to me. <laughs> and, and, and you kind of wonder, who are you going to have lunch with? It's a funny thing, isn't it? No matter how confident someone can be on the outside, no matter how accomplished a person is, there's, there's always something inside of us, each of us, asking the question, a little voice in the back of our head that's, that's asking the question, am I enough? We, we, we look to different things to define us. We look to different things to, to tell me who I am. So for some of us, we, we find that, that thing in our families, and we say, well, I have a big family, so that, that makes me good. I'm, I'm good to go. This is who I am. I'm, I'm the person with a big family. Or perhaps you're single, and you're like, look, I'm single, and I'm proud of it. And that's going to tell me who I am. Or, or perhaps you're, you're really good at school, and you're like, I get straight A's. This is who I am. Or, or you might be an athlete or a business person. We, we, we might even say that, for some of us, when asked who you are, your response is, I'm a Presbyterian. <laughs> I've got the shorter and larger catechism memorized. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I think for each of us, we're looking for something to tell us who we are. I've, over the course of this last year, I've, I've really gotten into Super Tramp, the the band, and, and, and one of the songs that I, I love is the song, the logical song, and, and, and there's this word that's just haunting in it where they say, please tell me who I am, and the song ends with, who am I, who am I? We all want to know who we are. The passage we come to today approaches this question, and it gives us an answer. Peter here is writing to a group of Christians scattered to the east of Rome in an area roughly the size of Turkey or, or, or the southeastern part of the U.S. or southwestern part of the U.S. They are, uh, they've been kicked out of Rome because they are Christians. It, it's probably a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles, and they have been displaced from their homes, and all they have now is nothing. The lands into which they've moved, all of the people that, that, they, that know them and that, that are around them know why they've been kicked out of Rome. They've been kicked out of Rome because they are the Christians. They're the troublemakers in the empire. They're the problem. Peter writes this letter in the opening portion of this letter to tell them and us that it's those who feel like strangers and exiles that have been born into a new family, the family of God. Thus, we should live like it. We're going to explore this new identity that God gives us and how to live into it through four points. Uh, I'm, 
I'm, I'm a Presbyterian, I know. I should have three or five, but I'm going four. And, and, uh, and the points are God saves us, God sees us, God soothes us, and God secures us. There are four S's, so I could be a Baptist. Um, <laughs> see, Peter start, sets up this whole situation by telling, the, by telling us that we were ignorant, controlled by our passions, and futile in our thinking. I mean, quite literally what Peter is saying here is that our hope has been misplaced. Do you see it? In, in verse 3, he says that Christians are born again into a living hope. In verse 14, he tells us that we were ignorant, controlled by our passions, and futile in our thinkings. Uh, just so that you know, in case you're wondering, if you're looking at your bulletin, you're like, wait, the passage he read right before the sermon was, was just the first part of, why, why is he talking about the whole book, uh, the whole chapter uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1? Well, it's because we're going to preach the whole chapter. So if you have your Bible, open it to it. If not, use, you're going to have to flip back and forth. I'm sorry. Um, he, he, says that we're, he says that we're born again to a living hope. Uh, this, is, I mean, this is really amazing language, if you think about it. Peter doesn't say, like Paul often does, that we were dead in our sins and trespasses. No, what Peter says here is that he says that the life into which we were born in the flesh is a life of futility and ignorance. He says the world into which we are born and raised is a world into futility and ignorance. I, I wonder if you wonder to yourself, how, how can he say this? What does he, what does he mean when... He says this, how is our thinking futile? What in, the, what, what in the world is Peter talking about here? What, what, what Peter's getting at is, is so often in this world there are things that tell us if you just do this, if you just believe this, if you just see this, if you just grab onto this, this is the thing that will give you hope. So what are the things in this world that tell you if you just do this, if you're just this way, then you have hope for the future. What are the things in the world that tell you this is what reality is actually like? And as we think about those things, what we find is that these are the things that, are, that, that show us that we are so often ignorant and futile and controlled by our passions. We, we set our confidence on, on these things in this world only to find out that they aren't hope, but they're wishes. So, so when we look for our status in, in a society, in a community, when, when, we, when we look for our, our, our belonging in our education or the education of our children, when, when we think about our money or our positions at work, when we think about our family or our politics or even our theology, and we think, this thing gives me hope for the future. It's this. This is what will give me the identity that I've been looking for. Peter says that's what it means to be futile in your thinking, to be controlled by your passions, and to be ignorant. Our passions control us. We're, we're ignorant and, and futile in our thinking. When we look to people and things and say, this will tell me that I am enough. And the sad reality is those things never deliver what they promise to deliver to you. Peter tells us our ancestors may have believed that. Our culture may tell us that that's true, but this is not reality. Our community, our society, our education, our family, our money, our politics, even our theology will never give us the hope that we are looking for. So what does Peter say? Well, he tells us that our situation is hopeless because we have a misplaced hope. That is to say, when we place our hope on things of this world, our hope turns out to be no more than a mere wish. However, Peter says that God saves us from this futility, the first S. The language that, Paul, that, that Peter here uses makes it sound worse than just being saved from futility, but, but it's actually language where he's trying to paint a picture of a life wherein we are a part of a slave trade. We're, we're in slavery. We're doomed to death and destruction. And, and this life will lead to nothing but death. However, Peter tells us that God saves us. He saves us from this life of ignorant futility. 
And he talks about this salvation in terms of new birth, verses uh, 3 and 23. This new birth is, is not like our old birth in, in the flesh, it, but it's, it's a birth that will not fade or waste away because it's birthed by the Spirit. The old birth was one that, was, that would wither and fall like the grass and the flower, verses 23 and 24. But this new life into which we have been saved is one that is imperishable. It's, it's a new life which is generated from an imperishable seed. And what is that imperishable seed this, that, 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 that this new life is generated from? It's the Word of God. What do you trust to keep you safe? Not, not just physically safe, but what do you trust to keep you emotionally and spiritually safe? What do you build to protect you from, from the possibility that you might get hurt? Maybe you've built an image of yourself as the confident one that has all of the answers. You are the, the woman that everybody comes to when they have questions about anything because you have all the answers. How's that working for you? In your quieter moments? Do you sit there worrying about what happens when people find out that you actually don't have all the answers? That you actually aren't omniscient? Do you look to your job or maybe your athletic prowess as something that will show everybody and yourself that you are enough? How, how's that working? What happens when your job disappears? Either by choice or by other means. What, what happens when you get injured? Because you're going to get injured as an athlete. Listen to the words of Peter today. The Lord can save you from ignorant and futile ways of thinking where you are controlled by your passions, Peter says. And he does this through the blood of his son and our receiving of that, uh, of that grace of salvation by faith. In being saved, we are, we are moved from a family that only leads to death, from, from slavery, from, from a family that's only going to lead to death and destruction. And we're moved into a family where we can have a hope, a, a family that, that can truly uh, give us hope because our hope is fixed on a reality that happened in the past, and thus we can have sure hope into the future. Peter tells us not only that God saves his children, but God also sees his children. No, notice how he does that here. Remember, this is a people that have, that have lost everything, they are outcasts in society, in a time and in a, in a place where having power and having wealth was really laid into where you lived and what you owned, the, the property that you had. These people had been exiled from their homeland and everything they had had been taken away. And Peter says, God sees that. He, he, he sees that, he, he knows that, and he, and he speaks to this uncertainty of their life. The uncertainty telling them that, that what they have in the future is imperishable, it's undefiled, it's unfading, it's an inheritance that is, that is kept for them by God. Yet at the same time, this truth doesn't mean that God just ignores their situation. It's not like God says, hey, look, I have a future for you. And that should be good enough. So just buck it up and, 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 and get on with it. Now Peter says, life is hard. He, he acknowledges the hardness of life. Though in the midst of hard things, he says, we can know that God, we, we can know that our Father holds our inheritance surely because we have an elder brother, Jesus Christ, who has secured this inheritance for us. Thus, we can walk through the fiery trials of life with hope 
And, and not a dead hope. What does Peter call it? He calls it a living hope. It's easy in our day and age to be hopeless, isn't it? We, we can look around the world and we can see despair. There is plenty to be worried about. There, there are wars. There is social and civil unrest, not only in our country, but around the world. There is economic inequality. There, in, in the U.S., we have a, we have a political system where, wherein it seems like neither party is really interested in governing, but both parties are interested in having power for the sake of having power. We can look at the failings of the church, the failings of the church just to be the church. And, and then we can say, when I stand up, when I stand up and, and, and declare Christian values, whether it be related to human sexuality or racial inequality, I find that I am attacked from both sides. Either I'm too conservative and thus I'm a Christian nationalist, or I'm, too, or I'm too liberal and thus I've just gone woke. I, I could spend the rest of our time here just talking about the ways in which we can despair. That'd be a fun sermon, wouldn't it? <laughs> However, in the midst of our despair, what Peter is telling us, what Peter told the Christians in the first century, what he's telling us is that God sees you. He, he knows you. He sees how you struggle in this world, and he cares. He, he sees you, and he wants you to know that you have a living hope because you look to a living Christ. You can stand up under those trials because in the midst of them, you can look to Christ, your elder brother. So God sees, saves us, he sees us, and he also soothes us. See, God doesn't just see that we struggle in this world, but he steps into that struggle with us to comfort us and to bring healing. You, you see, God not only knows that uh, this life it can bring deep pain, but he wants us to know also that in the midst of that deep pain, he shows up. I mean, this is the grace that is brought to us in our salvation. Part of the grace is that we don't suffer alone. We have the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and, 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 and comes alongside us in the midst of our suffering. But not only that, we have been born into a family, a, a new family. Look at all the family imagery that, that shows up in this. This passage, this chapter is packed with family language. God is our father. The, the, the son is our brother. We have brothers and sisters. We've been brought into a family. We have an inheritance. This is family language. This whole book is about family and living into that family of God. And Peter says that when you're in the midst of suffering, when you're in the midst of pain and sorrow, not only does God save you and see you, he soothes you. He soothes you with his Holy Spirit, but with one another as well. Peter wants us to remember that as we walk through this world, We have a father who walks with us. We have brothers and sisters who walk with us. And, and no matter our experience in, in our earthly families, with our, with our siblings and our, and our fathers, this father cares for us and walks with us. He sees us and he soothes us so that we may experience it, the ups and downs of life, knowing that we belong. So God saves us, he sees us, he soothes us, and finally he secures us. Have you ever wondered, uh, uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite, uh, it's, I don't know if this is the reason that God put our elbows where he put our elbows. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought, why, why is my elbow exactly where it is? 
I'm sure all of you at some point have. If you're a doctor here, don't listen to me because you probably know more about anatomy and physiology and can tell me, no, that's not actually the reason that, that God put the elbow there. But I think one of the reasons God put, his, put our elbows where he put our elbows is because when a baby is born, their sight is only a certain distance. And wouldn't you know it, when you're holding that baby in your arms and you're going, this is the distance that the baby can see. And quite literally, one of the most important parts of child development is those first years where you're holding the baby in your arms and the baby is imprinting on you and you're imprinting on the, on the child. And the child is quite literally, for good or ill, becoming like you. You're, you're forming the neural pathways for this child so that this child is going to act and think much like you. I think this is why the elbow exists where it does. <laughs> because when I'm holding my children, I'm making them like me. And you see, this is what God does for us. We're born into this new family. We're newborn babes born into this family. And what does he do? He secures us. And how does he secure us? He secures us so that we become like him. As newborn babes, he holds us so that we may imprint on him and he may imprint on us. Our name is graven on his hand. As we stare at our father, we quite literally become like him. And this is why Peter then says, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. And how do we do that? We do that by, by staring at him. We become like him. He, he sees us. He, he saves us. He, he sees us. He soothes us. And, and this leads us then to a secure relationship with our God where we can risk everything. We can go out and risk everything because we know we have a father who cares for us. And, and thus, we can be like God in the midst of a world that hates God. In a world that tells us that we are to love people that look like us, we, we come into a church and we look around and we say, that's not what God has done. God doesn't love people that look like him. He loves people so that people might become like him. And thus, we can love one another, which is, I mean, what's that, the end of, that, of this passage? It's, it's all about brotherly love. Why? Because that's what it means to look like God. It means to love one another. The church is a place where God brings together people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, people that don't look like us, but who are starting to look like God. This is the first Sunday of the year, and this Sunday is, is uh, historically inside the church, a time where we remember the murder of the innocents in Bethlehem. In the Greco-Roman world, this would have been an odd thing. It would have been odd to commemorate this. This is the ultimate will to power, isn't it? A, a, a mighty, powerful king making sure that his subjects don't get another king goes out and kills the weakest in the, in the land. This is the way of the world. Yet the church thought it was important. God thought it was important. So important that in the middle of the birth narrative of Jesus, what does he do? He stops and says, hey, let me tell you about something that happened. Something that, that, that is grotesque by any standard. Why, why does he do this? Well, he does it so that we wouldn't forget. What does it mean to look and act like our father? It means to be 
a people who love the least and the last, the, the, the most, the powerless in society. We're to be a people that care for the orphan and the widow. We are to be a people that love life in a culture that loves death because our God is a God of life. Let me close with this last observation. It, it would be an easy observation to miss. I mean, you see in this passage, God brings us into this family. The whole chapter is, is chock full of this family language. We, we see uh, that we are children uh, of God by grace and not by nature. He, he saves us. He sees us. He soothes us. He secures us. And yet, what is the context for all of this? Where do we learn to live out this reality? See, Peter tells us that we learn to live out this reality in the context of worship. Notice how, how Peter opens this chapter. He, he opens this passage by, by beginning with worship. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, he's praising God. And then he talks about the beauty of this salvation. And, and how, how did the... How did the churches learn about the beauty of this salvation? They learned through the preaching of the word, uh, 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 the preaching of this gospel that angels long to peer into. Uh, I would love to spend a bunch more time on that, but George has told me that my sermon is already too long, so I'll, I'll, I'll not talk about that. But, but the, me, the beauty of this is that on, on, on this side of the cross, we are a privileged people. And that's what Peter says here. The, the, this salvation, this gospel, this good news is preached and experienced in the context of worship. You see, what we do here on Sunday morning is not just a nice ritual. It's not just a holy huddle that we get into. It's not just an opportunity to see friends and have some coffee. But what we do as we gather for worship is that we experience real reality. Peter opens with worship, and throughout this, he reminds the, us of the centrality of worship because it's in the context of worship that we learn our new, real, our new identity and we learn how to live into it. It's in the context of worship that we're reminded that while we might not be enough, we worship a Savior who is. It's in the context of worship that we're brought into the family with a father who keeps us safe, a father who sees us, a father who soothes us, a father who secures us. It's in the context of worship that we, that we learn that we have an elder brother who, who has given all of himself for us and suffered on our behalf. And even now... Even now we have the Holy Spirit uniting us to that triune life and to one another. It's in the context of worship that we learn all of this. And, and thus we're able to go out of this place living into that reality, a reality that the world tells us isn't real. But the worship of the triune God that the gospel tells us is real, that our Father tells us is the real reality. God saves us. He sees us. He soothes us. He secures us. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Let him who has ears to hear hear what the Spirit says to his church. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come to you thankful for your gospel, which draws us into your family, makes us your children. Yet so often, Lord, we know that we, we don't act like it. So Lord, we come confessing. Oh Lord, you are the great and awesome God. You, you keep covenant and steadfast love with those who love you and keep your commandments. Thus, Lord, we come confessing that we have sinned. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. We have rebelled and turned aside from your commandments. To you, O oh Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. We have sinned against you 
and not obeyed your voice. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Let's pray. for the assurance of pardon. I am sure of this, my beloved. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Therefore, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Brothers and sisters, this is the promise of God. This is the word of the Lord. He says to us, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thanks be to God. Amen. our profession to those of the saints who have gone before us, proclaiming to one another and before a watching world, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended in hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From us we shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy church, both visible and invisible, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give them thanks and praise. It is right. And it is a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks <coughs> to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, O triune God. And we join our voices with the angels, the archangels, and the whole company of heaven in this hymn of eternal praise. <laughs>
We come to one of my favorite parts of the service. God invites us to a family meal, and we come to his table that he has spread for us by giving his son. And there's a great story in the Old Testament about someone coming to a table where he didn't belong. Um, in that, that time period, as a new king would come, the first thing a king would do would, do would be what Herod did, which is kill everyone else from the household of the former king. So that they don't want the throne later in life and come and kill you. But when David came into the, the throne of Israel, um, what would be expected is you bring in everyone from Saul's house and you put them to death. So David established his throne, things were peaceful, and he said, is there anyone left from Saul's house? And his servant said, yeah, there's, there's one more, his name is Mephibosheth. Okay, bring him to me. Well, Mephibosheth would have been terrified coming into David's presence, and David said this, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. And this is how he finished. He said, Listen, you don't belong here, but come to my table. You shall eat bread at my table continually. So David said to what should have been the house of his enemy, the guy who should be putting to death, welcome to the family. And I want you to have a spot at my table the rest of your life. And what God does to us at the Lord's table is come to his enemies that should be put to death for their sins. He said, listen, you've got a spot at my table continually. And on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Do this in remembrance of me. Though Jesus spreads a table, and he said, I'm giving you myself. Come and welcome to this family table. So everyone who puts their trust in Christ and who's a member of a church walking in repentance, come to this table, this family meal that God spreads for you and be fed. If you're not a Christian or you're not walking in repentance, this is a family meal, so don't come to this table. But the family is always open. Christ loves to bring his enemies and to give them a feast. So come to Christ. Well, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you came to your enemies. You came to us. And we, have, we should have no place at your family table. But you have welcomed us. And you have said to your enemies, come, sit at my table continually. And so, Lord, we, we ask that as we come and take bread and wine this morning, we pray that you would meet with us by your spirit and give us Jesus himself who died for us. And, Lord, we pray that you'd fill us with faith. And as we look at your face day by day, we pray that we would look more like our Father in heaven. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, we have three tables, one on each side, one in the middle. There is gluten-free bread on a white plate, and the wine is in the center. There's grape juice on the outer ring, and Pastor George will be in the lobby. Anyone who'd like to pray, you can go pray with Pastor George. We'll come to the table where Christ has given us himself to his family.
go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we hail you in this newborn year, thanking you for life and breath, for fresh opportunity, for new beginnings. Though none of us knows all that will befall us this year in joys and sorrows, but this we do know. On every occasion and in every circumstance, your great love for us endures. Your abounding grace is sufficient. Your promises are certain. You save us. That you uh, see us. You soothe us. You secure us. Now, on this New Year's morn, we therefore declare with confidence, our days are in your hands. Claiming your very great and precious promises, we do now pray, Lord, hear our prayers. We cry out to you for the pageant and our families as they grieve the loss of Marvin and Judy. Lord, we pray for healing for Greg and Tom, for Keith and Perry, for Tricia and Alfonso, for Grace. Lord, we pray for those who are caring for those in their families in deep distress, uh, for Kim and Mirandi, for uh, Nolan and Stephanie. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray that you would encourage them, uphold them, strengthen them, and in this new year, bless them. In this new year, Lord, uh, give us your grace to sanctify, your comfort to cheer, your wisdom to teach, uh, your right hand to guide, your counsel to instruct, your law to direct, your presence to comfort. Uh, May your glory be our awe. May our triumphs be our joy. And by the power of your spirit, supply our every thought, direct our every step, prosper uh, our every work, advance your kingdom at every turn. And to this end, we do now pray, even as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Now receive the Lord's benediction from 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Lord has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. May he grant you grace and mercy to know this gospel of life. Amen. 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 January, the first Wednesday of February will be prayer meetings, and then the three Wednesdays in between we'll do a lecture and discussion series on Christ and culture. If you've been wondering, how on earth do we address, how do we respond to what seems to be a culture gone awry? Now we'll wrestle with that and discuss that over three consecutive Wednesday nights. Uh, there are some cards that you can grab and invite others who might be wrestling uh, with these questions as well. Also, you'll notice uh, that the new January uh, Bible reading cards are available. We try and read through the Bible together as a church every year. If you fell off the wagon sometime, say, in March or April this last year, you can get right back on now. And because today is January the 1st, you're not behind. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to see the full panoply of all of God's gracious blessings to us. So let's read the Bible together this year. Go forth in his grace and Happy New Year. <laughs> 